North African desert. For centuries, force has ruled the endless miles of sand. On February the 14th, 1941, the Nazi forces rolled into the city of Tripoli with a mechanized might that would prove to be nearly unstoppable. The Germans controlled all of North Africa except Egypt. If they could take Egypt and the Suez Canal, they could then advance onto the Persian Gulf and take out the major source of oil for the Allies. General Erwin Rommel intended to do just that. He became known by a name that terrified his enemies, the Desert Fox. He soon did such a tremendous job in reversing the war situation in the North African desert that the British themselves attached the moniker the Desert Fox to him. And he got to be a boogeyman, for lack of a better word, for the average British soldier who got to thinking, we can't defeat this guy. It seemed to be Rommel's war, and victory seemed close. But the desert would soon conjure up an opponent. The fox would soon encounter the magician. Real blade. I shaved with this one this morning. And if you'll pardon me, I'll just take my medicine. At the beginning of the Second World War, Jasper Maskelin was in London performing illusions for which he was renowned. Don't you make me laugh, I shall cut the tonsils out. One of the most vivid ones I remember, because it was probably his most famous one, was the uh, razor blades. He always did it with a great deal of panache. Jasper Maskelin was one of London's most celebrated performers. His special talent was magic. This is to tie them all together. Magic ran back three generations. His grandfather, John Neville Maskelin, started the magic business in 1865 with a friend. They succeeded in getting to London and in 1873 took a lease on the Egyptian Hall. And for the next almost 32 years, uh, they had a theatre of magic there. Then it was demolished and so they moved to St George's Hall in Langham Place and there they continued until 1933. In other words, 60 continuous years of magic in London. And that is a record that has been unequaled anywhere else in the world. But in wartime, the theatres were empty and the magic had gone out of Jasper Maskelyne's act. Britain faced the menace of the Nazis as they marched across Europe and North Africa. A sense of patriotism and of egotism pulled at Maskelyne. He decided to go to war, if not for his country, then for himself. He was stuck in a world that was destitute, that was desperate, and there were no great stages. There were no great performance areas for him to, to work his craft. I think what was driving him was a need to be a participant. He had to belong. He had to have a role. And all he had to contribute was his knowledge of magic. He had this ability to conceal things when people were looking straight at them. Now, that is the art of camouflage. So his answer was, I think I can get a job in the British Army in their camouflage division. 
If I could stand in the focus of powerful footlights and deceive attentive and undisturbed onlookers, separated from me only by the width of the orchestra pit, then I could most certainly devise means of deceiving German observers a mile away or more. Maskelyne lobbied hard at the war office, signing forms and answering endless questions, only to be rejected. Jasper's mission to uh, use his magic to assist in warfare, of course, was not something that readily was understood by recruiting officers. Furthermore, when war broke out among that month, Jasper was 37, which was an age bracket uh, which was not immediately being conscripted. And further, he wasn't in the reserve, so here was this man coming along with ideas they were unfamiliar with. And it took him a long time to break down their resistance until eventually he was accepted into the Royal Engineers. On October the 14th, 1940, Maskelyne arrived at Filey Castle in Surrey to attend a camouflage training school, but he found it tedious. He did not fit in. He was dealing with men who'd been in the army all their lives, men who believed in tradition and the correct way of doing things, and um, they couldn't really see that there was anything to be done by um, a conjurer. When Maskelyne tried to combine his skills of illusion and deception with the more traditional camouflage techniques of the day, he was greeted with suspicion. Camouflage was mostly being developed by engineers. And while the engineers are great at building things and implementing things, it takes something of a creative person uh, to develop the new ideas uh, to put into play. And Maskelyne really believed, with justification as it turned out, uh, that he was an original thinker uh, that could basically make camouflage do things it had never done before. Though Maskelyne could not seem to sway his superior officers, he believed he just needed the right audience. When the esteemed Inspector General of the British Army's Lord Gort arrived to review the unit's progress, Maskelyne seized the opportunity to impress him. He needed to show them that his magic worked. He planned to hide a machine gun bunker using stage magic. He played the audience, his inspector general, just as he plays an audience in a theater. There's the opening, the inspector general is looking around. There's a suspense. There's the moment of kind of disbelief. And all of a sudden the general is going, I can't see it, but I know it's around here. And whack, this broom handle hits him on the legs. Lord Gort admitted to being tricked after tripping up on a broomstick handle that posed as the barrel of a machine gun. And he bought it. At that moment, he bought into the magic. Impressed by Maskelyne's tricks, Lord Gort signed him up for duty. In late December 1940, he was bound for North Africa. The stage was set for the showdown between the Desert Fox and the Magician. I believed I could banish batteries, tanks, warships, even aircraft. I thought that tricks could be played on German commanders. Maskelyne reached Cairo in the spring of 1941. He tried unsuccessfully to drum up assignments for himself. His superiors believed he should use his magical powers in a more traditional manner to entertain the troops. In return for performing some magic shows, Maskelyne was allowed to form his own unit. The army called it the Camouflage Experimental Section. Maskelyne called it his magic gang. He interviewed 400 men, but only a select few would be chosen. Men who were not afraid to cut corners or break regulations to get what they needed. He pulled together quite a motley crew. There was a cartoonist from Punch, a stained glass window expert, a pottery worker, an electrical engineer, 
and some analytical chemists, and one who I would imagine was very useful to him, uh, a carpenter, together with uh, a designer of stage scenery. These constituted his magic gang. They were undisciplined, unorthodox, and unwanted by the mainstream military establishment, but the magic gang had guts, glory, and imagination. They set up their headquarters in the Cairo suburb of Abyssia and were ready for duty. But months went by with no assignment. Finally, a job materialized. German bombers were attacking the Allies' most critical supply point in the Middle East. In desperation, British commandos turned to the magic gang. June 1941, the heat of the Mediterranean sun bore down upon an army of men and machines. This was Britain's chief naval base in the Middle East and the war brought hundreds of ships to Alexandria Harbour. They were a prime target for the German Luftwaffe. In desperation, the British command decided to put Jasper Maskelin to work and ordered him to do a vanishing trick, to make Alexandria Harbour disappear. While Maskelin was excited by the challenge, he knew that if he failed, he and his gang would be sent packing. On June the 18th, Maskelin and his men surveyed the harbour. They were thinking of the usual ways you camouflage things. Can we paint canvas and put it over the ship? Well, you had hundreds of ships. You had hundreds of buildings. You had several square miles of harbor water. It was impossible. And then something dawned on him that he decided it could be done. He says, fellas, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to move Alexandria Harbor. We're not going to hide it. We're going to move it. Using mud, canvas and cardboard, hundreds of engineers began working under Maskelyne's direction to build a decoy harbour of dummy warships at what was then known as Mariut Bay. With a shape similar to Alexandria Harbour and just a few miles away, the bay stood a good chance of confusing bomber pilots flying under the cover of darkness. The decoy was built specifically for an audience that would be airborne at about 8,000 feet, though it was smaller in scale than the real harbour. Maskelyne paid special attention to getting the perspective right. If you think about perspective, again, if you look at the big illusions that you see on stage, or the grand illusions of vanishing an airplane, those have a lot to do with perspective. It all depends on how you look at it. And Jasper knew that. So what he did was he put his mind's eye in the eye of the pilots and he built on the ground the perspective to give them the image they needed to see. As a professional conjurer, Maskelyne knew that light and shadow could direct or misdirect the attention of an audience. So he made sure that his set builders lit up the decoy to resemble Alexandria's naval buildings.